Om Agyan Timirandasya Kena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swa Padantikam Pande Ham Shiguro Shiyuta Padakamalam Chigurun Vaishnavamscha Si Rupam Sagraja Tam Sahagana Dragana Tam Pitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Bitam Scha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasnaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesa Sunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasnaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Tinamine Sri Varshavana Bidevi Daite Kripabdaye Krishna Sambandha Vigyanam Daine Prabhave Namaha Madur Ojwala Premadya, Sri Rupa Nuga Bhakti Dak, Sri Gora Karuna Shakti Vigrahaya Namostite, Namaste Gauravani Sri Murtaye Dina Tarine, Rupa Nuga Virapa Siddhanta Dvanta Harine, Namo Gora Kishoraya Saksad Vairagya Murtaye, Vipalamba Asambo De Padambu Jayate Namaha. Namo Bhakti Venotaya Satchirananda Namine Gaura Shakti Sarupaya Rupanuga Parayate Gorvi Bhava Bhumestvam Nirjasesa Sajanapriya Vaishnava Sarva Bhoma Sri Jagannathaya Te Namaha Vanshakalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Peevacha Patitaram Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Namo Mahabhadanaya Krishna Prema Padayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namani Gauda Triste Namaha Panchatattva Makam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Sarupakam Bhakta Avatar Bhakta Kyam Namami Bhakta Shakti Kram He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Dayatam Surato Pongo Mama Manda Mutir Guti Mat Sarvasya Thambo Jo Radha Mada Mohano Divya Rinda Kalpa Druma Da Sirup Kalpa Sirat Nagara Singhasana Sto Sri Sri Radha Govinda Devo Pristali B Sevya Mana Smarami Shri Ma Rasa Rasadam B. Vamsi Vata Tatasti Taha. Karsan Venu Tatar Saud Gopi. Gopi Nath Tate Namaha. Tapta Kanchana Gauran Gi Radhe Vrindavane Svari. Vishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Pige. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithananda. Shri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hmm. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So this is chapter 8, text number 15, Attaining the Supreme. Mamu Petya Purna Janma Dukalayam Mashasvatam Napduvanti Mahatmana Samsidim Paramam Gataha Mamu Petya Puna Janma Dukalaya Asasvatam 
Napnuvanti Mahatmanaha Samsidim Paramam Gata Mamu Petya Punar Janma Dukalaya Asasvatam Napduvanti Mahatmana Samsidim Paramam Gataha <laughs> when the uh, on the second and the fourth line, if there's a dot underneath the last letter, then you hold the letter. Only on the second and fourth line. So, like there's a dot under Mahatmana, but you don't say Mahatmanaha. You say Ahatmana, but in the last line it says Gata, so you say Gataha. So that dot gives emphasis in the pronunciation on the second and then the fourth line only because Sanskrit is usually written in two lines, not four. So that's why it's like that. <laughs> okay. It's good to know all these intricate things because this is our language. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else? Mum, me, Upetya, achieving, Puna, again, Janma, birth, Dukkha Alayam, places of misery, Ashasvatam, temporary, Na, never, Apnuvanti, Attain, Maha Atmanaha, the great souls, Sun Sibdim, perfection, Paramam, ultimate, Gataha, having achieved. Hmm, so Krishna is speaking. After attaining me, the great souls, who are yogis in devotion, never return to this temporary world which is full of miseries because they have attained the highest perfection. Purport. Since this temporary material world is full of miseries of birth, old age, disease, and death, naturally he who achieves the highest perfection and attains the supreme planet, Krishna Loka, Goloka Vrindavan, does not wish to return. So here, in this first sentence, Krishna, Krishna Prabhupada says a lot. He describes that this material world is a place of misery, but then he explains what are the miseries. Um, people have some ideas what is the miseries of this world, but here it explains what they actually are. Birth, old age, disease, and death. 
these are emplaced upon the soul, and therefore these are all unnatural for the soul's existence. We don't remember the miseries that we suffered at the time of birth, but it's described very, what we say, thoroughly in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which describes how the, the soul within the womb of the mother in the form of an unborn baby is struggling during those nine-month period, having to undergo so much, won't we say, difficulty. Um, if anybody is put in that situation, they would immediately die because there's no air in there. You know, one is encased in a sack. But because of Krishna's arrangement, the soul, the, the living entity can live. Prabhupada makes that point. Only because of Krishna's and, and arrangement, that baby has was able to grow. Otherwise, anybody, if they were put in any similar situation like that, they would die immediately because they can't breathe. <laughs> and of course, whatever the mother eats, the child gets. So if the mother eats something hot, spicy, pungent, or what we say, something that might cause disturbance, then the child also feels that in the womb. Uh, what the mother is going through during that time, we, that's a whole class in itself. We, don't, we won't talk about that. Ladies, they know what it's like to give birth, and it's always, always a very difficult situation for that time period, for them physically. Because there's love there, they, can, they tolerate it, but ultimately it's very difficult. And for the child, it says that not every child but those who are pious, at the seventh month, while they're in the womb, the covering of material energy is removed by the grace of Krishna. And then the soul starts to realize its situation and understands that it now it will again take birth in this material world. Feeling the anxiety of its next birth, the soul turns to Krishna and fervently plays, my dear Lord, when I come out again, Please, I want to become your devotee. Please don't make me forget you. So this, this, this particular soul, who's pious by nature, or even maybe, say, devotional by nature, gets the covering removed. That only happens by only to certain souls, not all. And the, the child can understand its f f previous birth, and it's about to take birth again. But then again... After taking birth, it's surrounded by very affectionate relatives, friends, and loved ones, and the child becomes what we say, what we say, pampered in so many ways, and it forgets the prayers it made in the womb. <laughs> and again, it begins its uh, life in this material world. So the undergoing of birth is very difficult, and even, even when the woman delivers, it's very difficult both for the child and for the, for the mother. When the child comes out, it doesn't come out dancing, chanting, and you know, doing all kinds of flips, you know. It, it's, it's, uh, it's suffering. It cries. The child sometimes can't breathe, so they have to put it on a special little machine to get, it, get its breath going like that. So it's a very difficult time for birth. We don't know that. <laughs> especially the men in the world, they have no idea what it's like. Uh, for the lady who's giving birth, um, Prabhupada was discussing this with one of his disciples, and the disciple was saying, yes, actually, Srila Prabhupada, I used to work on an ambulance, and many times we would get calls from ladies who were, were in labor, and we would go to take them to the hospital. And while we'd be driving to the hospital, they'd be cursing their husbands, <laughs> saying, never again. <laughs> because there is tremendous pain. Men couldn't probably tolerate that pain. It's not possible. It's not possible. The pain is so tremendous at childbirth for the woman. It, it becomes sometimes, they even lose consciousness. But because somehow or other, there's love there, and the child is there, 
they go through that situation. So birth in this world is not so easy. <laughs> So when you learn from, you know, the scriptures and you learn from... When I was in New Vrindavan last year, many of the ladies who were there, we had our, what we called New Vrindavan reunion with the old devotees who had been there in the early days. And at one point, a discussion turned to giving birth to children, how they were giving birth during these times when they were in the old days. And we... We didn't really have any money, so we didn't go to any hospitals. So all the children were born in the barn, usually, <laughs> or somewhere in somebody's house, like that. And so they had to go through a lot of the, you know, difficulties in very, what we say, uh, prearranged situations that were just put together by, by circumstance and how they had to go through this. So it's not an easy thing. So then when we talk about the miseries of birth, we should know it is not easy <laughs> to come into this world or even to bring a child into this world. It's very difficult. Um, the pain that is there is tremendous. And old age, everybody knows old age. No, we don't. Maybe not most. Of <laughs> We've been old in our previous life, but we can't remember what it's like. Huh? What did you say? Can't hear you. Can you talk a little louder? Let me turn up my hearing aid. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Can you give me my stick? I can't walk. <laughs> Are you there? I can't see you. Oh, okay. Yeah, now I can see you. <laughs> so we have, you have to have four eyes, three legs, and a couple of extra ears. <laughs> and then you have so many pains. <laughs> this pain, that pain, another pain. So uh, old age is not such a nice thing. You can see people can't even stand up straight. <laughs> I have a hard time walking, and when you're old, you get you, your tolerance level goes down. <laughs> you can't tolerate things as easy as you were or it was when you were younger. It's like that. And that's just natural. So people get on your nerves easy easier. <laughs> so when you see the old people, they get what they use. We use the word cranky. <laughs> It's just natural because it's the feature of old age, becoming cranky. And then the disease, we all know what disease is like. And of course now we're in the midst of a, what they call a pandemic, a worldwide disease that is... Uh, people who are alive right now will be dead soon. <laughs> it's just such a powerful disease. It's just circulating the planet in every country of the world. I just heard the news today that it was a news flash. I happened to see it on my computer that India has now come to the second stage or the second position for coronavirus in the world. Before it was the United States, Brazil, and India. Now India is second. And so India is suffering like crazy because it's just some, they, they can't really deal with it because it's such a huge population. So disease is there, and you have to be very careful because anybody can just cough on you and then you're out. <laughs> you <know? laughs> or, you know, sometimes you run outside without the proper dress on and you get sick, you get a fever or a cold. And so disease, we're always trying to take precautions to make sure we remain healthy. It's a constant thing with this world. And of course, as Shakespeare says, there's the rub. He's talking about death. So after you go through so much disease and sickness and problems in life, then you die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a nice place. <laughs> so therefore, when Prabhupada says this temporary world is full of material miseries, it's not an overstatement, it's actually an understatement. Because nowadays, as we, as modern society increases its technology, there are more and more and easier ways to meet death. 
It becomes more and more available. <laughs> and then what Prabhupada goes on to say, one who reaches, somehow reaches the supreme planet does not return. And here we go. The supreme planet is described in Vedic literatures as avyakta and aksara and paramagati. In other words, that planet is beyond our material vision and it's inexplicable, but it's the highest goal, the destined for the great souls, the destination for the great whole. So what do we know about the spiritual world? Is what we hear from uh, great souls who, who are realized in the, in the scriptures in the form of understanding that yes, there is a spiritual world and it's completely opposite of this material world where there's no birth, no old age, no disease, no death. Life is eternal and life is full of joy and everyone is in complete and perfect knowledge. So there is a place, although it's beyond our vision. The Mahatmas receive transcendental messages from the realized devotees and thus gradually develop devotional service in Krishna consciousness and become so absorbed in transcendental service that they no longer desire elevation to any of the material planets, nor do they even want to be transferred to the spiritual planet. So here, one who is fully engaged in tasting the happiness of Krishna consciousness thinks that any other destination other than the spiritual world is just a waste of time or useless, a useless attainment but the guy goes on to say here that they don't even want to go to the spiritual world because they're happy in devotional service. Now this is an interesting, the devotional service is so satisfying that one even feels that, wow, there's nowhere to go. I'm completely happy serving the Lord and completely in touch with the Lord through that service. So that's a high state of Krishna consciousness, but that is also available. Prabhupada goes on to say, they only want Krishna and Krishna's association and nothing else. And that is the highest perfection of life. This verse specifically mentions that the personalist devotees of the Supreme Lord Krishna, these devotees in Krishna consciousness achieve the highest perfection of life. In other words, they are the supreme souls, one who qualifies themselves to go back home and back to Godhead. Now, Krishna says in his verse, they never return to this temporary world because they have attained the highest perfection. So sometimes devotees ask this question, which is sometimes we find it's a question that's often asked, and that is, well, does that mean once we go back we can never come back? No, you can, but you won't. <laughs> it's like the example would be putting your hand into a fire and having it burnt, and then you have the experience of the burning sensation, so you won't do it again. So once returning to the spiritual world, one will remember their sojourn in this material world and all the births they were in, they will see it as simply a bad dream and they will never desire to come again. But if for some reason a soul wants to come, for whatever reason, we can't think of a reason, but then they can. They can also come back. Of course, sometimes souls want to come and preach to the conditioned souls as a service to the Supreme Lord, but that is glorious. They don't come under the influence of karma. They come under as a, as a messenger of the Lord uh, to do the work of compassion in this material world. But that's, that's, that's there for some select souls who have the desire to serve the Lord in that way. But in the principle here, as Krishna says, because... This world is full of miseries. You just don't come back again. <laughs> yeah, it's just natural that you won't, you won't want to come back anymore. 
The problem is we don't want to leave this place when we're here now. That's the problem. <laughs> so when we understand what is there in the spiritual world, and of course, dissociation of Krishna is the ultimate principle of happiness, and that's what makes up the spiritual world is Krishna. Without this Krishna, this spiritual world has no meaning. So therefore, association with Krishna in the spiritual world is the greatest and highest and of perfection of, that one can attain in any sphere of life, at any time, anywhere, any place. So that's what the devotees aspire with, to again be in the association of Krishna and to exchange loving relationships with the Supreme Lord. In this world, we have, uh, we have our loving relationships with our husband and wife, with our children, or with friends in gentle, general. But we can't compare these experiences to what it's like to having a loving relationship with Krishna. Although these things may also be pleasant, at least sometimes, we find that our relation with Krishna is much higher in what we say, the happiness that is achieved. Sometimes, when we are engaged in devotional service, especially when we are in kirtan, the kirtan becomes so powerful that we feel such exhilaration of spiritual happiness that it overwhelms us and we just dance like crazy or feel and we just express our happiness in different ways. These are just small, tiny uh, uh, little, little drops of the happiness that is available in uh, our relationship with Krishna. It was described by, um, um, who was it? Uh, hmm. I think it was Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Yeah, Bhaktivinoda Thakur. I'm standing and on the shore of the ocean of devotion to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and I'm simply trying to taste one drop of the happiness from that unlimited ocean. That one drop is enough to drown the whole world in unlimited joy and happiness. So what to speak about that unlimited ocean? So in the prayers of Lord Chaitanya, Known as Shikshastakam, the first one of the one of the principles of the glories of chanting is Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam. Ananda means bliss, transcendental happiness. Bhuti means deep or unlimited, and Vardhanam means ocean. In this case. So the happiness that one can achieve is an unlimited ocean of happiness, which can never compare to anything in this world. In fact, the happiness in this world, compared to even a drop of the happiness in the material realm, it looks like suffering, that's all. <laughs> Although it may go on as happiness in this world. And that's, that's described in Nectar Devotion. Even the happiness of Brahman realization multiplied millions of times cannot compare to the happiness that one experiences in the loving relationship and devotional service with Lord Sri Krishna. So therefore, uh, Srila Prabhupada always emphasis, we should want to go back home, back to God. <laughs> we should make that our goal to somehow go back home, back to Godhead. Or, higher than that, is to want to serve the Lord wherever He puts us in any place. But still, if you desire to go back home, back to Godhead, as Prabhupada says, very few souls in this world actually desire like that. So if you desire like that, Krishna feels that this person is very special. <laughs> and therefore Krishna will help <laughs> like that. So this verse has a very interesting statement is that now once we attain that state and that attaining that state is really going back to where we where we came from it's not like we're going to a new place 
it's like returning to our home. <laughs> this material world is like going on a trip away from our home and wandering and getting lost, not knowing where we are or what direction we're going in. <laughs> so somehow we're here. How we got here, very hard to say. Sometimes we say that we came here because we were envious of Krishna and somehow because of that envy that caused us to fall down into this material world. But whatever reason we're here, a Prabhupada did use another uh, example. He never spoke this very much. I think he spoke it once. It's when someone asked, well, uh, you know, how did we come here? And Prabhupada used an interesting example. He said, you're walking down the street and you come to a movie theater and inside the movie theater, it's described on the outside of the movie theater, there's a very scary horror movie playing. <laughs> so you think, oh, if I go in there, I'll get scared. But let me go anyway. So what is that curiosity? So sometimes a soul may fall into this world just to be curious what it's like to come to the material world. That's a possibility also. But then again, once you get here, you kind of regret the idea. <laughs> it's like, like why, why did I buy that ticket, you know? <laughs> I want my money back. I don't like this popcorn. <laughs> So, yeah, it's like we made a mistake, but it's a big one. <laughs> so, but whatever reason is, the idea is to go back like that. And Krishna is more eager, and this is not an exaggeration, this is Krishna is more eager to take us back than we are to go back. Because that is love. Just like the mother knows what the child needs, except the child may not understand and sometimes fight the mother, but at the same time the mother knows this is best for the child. In the same way, Krishna knows that staying in this material world, we're suffering, and therefore he does many things in order to somehow get us out. And the most compassionate form of, of that uh, an endeavor to bring us back is when he comes personally in his personal form. And when he comes as Lord Chaitanya, when he comes as you know Krishna or any of the incarnations, Lord Nishringadev, when he comes to this material world, he comes out of compassion for the conditioned souls. And that's his most compassionate feature. He also comes by sending his pure representative, the spiritual master. He sends the Shastras, the books, and he also comes in the form of his name, which is, in this age, the incarnation, Kali Kale, Nama Rupa, Krishna Avatar, Nama Hoite Haya Sarvajigat Nistara, that in this age, Krishna has come in the form of his name. And he's come in the form of Prashadam. He comes in the form of so many things in order to somehow, his, his deity form, so many ways just to somehow or other attract us back to the spiritual world. So uh, we see the endeavors that Krishna makes to bring us back. So if we, if we are grateful, we should try to reciprocate by taking his compassion and uh, uh, coming back to him in devotion like that. It's just a feature of gratitude also. Okay, so we can stop there. I'll read the verse again. After attaining me, the great souls, who are yogis in devotion, never return to this temporary world which is full of miseries because they have attained the highest perfection. Okay? So do we have any comments or questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Should we look on material nature with fear, or should we look on material nature with um, respect? Maybe what attitude would you would you recommend? Um, it's called 
a fear, but it's a healthy fear. Healthy means that I know that material nature will trap me into so many uh, forms of suffering and activities that are useless. So we should be careful not to get caught into that. So it's not a fear that causes us anxiety, it's a fear based on knowledge. That I know that if I stick my hand in the fire, uh, it'll burn. I don't hate fire because fire is also useless, but at the same time, I know I should act in the right way so not to get trapped by the miseries of this world. So it's, it's fear based on knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense of respect there because the respect means that we respect the power of material nature. It's very powerful. <laughs> Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, perhaps you can tell us uh, in what time the soul gets covered with material energy. And when does it get covered by uh, material in, energy? In which month of pregnancy, perhaps? or Because you mentioned the seventh uh, months of pregnancy that pious uh, soul... Well, that's a special, that's special concession by the Lord for that soul. He takes the covering of the material energy off and the soul can see their previous birth and understand their, their situation. They will take birth again in this world. So that's, that gives the soul a chance to pray to the Lord. But the soul is always covered as long as it's encased in this material world. The coverings are always there. This is special concession. It's mentioned in the fourth canto, but this is only for certain souls, not all souls. But 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 to be in the material world means to be covered <laughs> by the covering potency or the covering feature is the three modes of material and energy: goodness, passion, and ignorance. They are energies that cover us. Does that answer your question? Thank you, yes. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Is Uruguay? He's over there, yeah. Can't see him, he's hiding behind the pole. <laughs> you used to ask a lot of questions, what happened? Uh, that means you know, that you're that means you're g getting all the answers now so uh. hmm? the motivation was wasn't per the motivation changed I'm become. I hope, hopefully, I'm becoming a devotee. Good, you became Sorry. hopeful. Good, <laughs> that's good. That's because your. I think because of your service attitude has increased tremendously, and that's because of that. Everything is becoming clear. That's an indication of knowing things. The more you engage in service, the more everything becomes clear. But, but Adi Purusha Prabhu is asking millions of questions, but his service attitude was is not problematic. <laughs> well, Adi Purusha just wants to stimulate discussion in class. That's why he answers the questions. He knows the answers. He's he's actually a good protagonist because we need that because devotees don't ask questions. But then when someone starts asking a question, then other devotees start asking questions. So usually when I give lectures I always ask someone in the audience ask a question I tell them ahead of time so they can start the whole thing off and then end other devotees. Otherwise people don't ask questions for some reason. Either they're shy 
or they think their question doesn't have any, you know, it's a stupid question. Or, <laughs> But then when somebody else asks a stupid question, they think, well, my question is not as stupid as his, so I'll ask my question. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Any good questions out there? <laughs> okay, I'm in the I'm in I'm in the mood to speak tonight, but if there's no questions then <laughs> we can stop here. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.